Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on training neural networks with TensorCourse. My name is Dushan, and I work at the Compute Architecture Group at NVIDIA, where we focus on improving performance of deep neural network training. In this talk, we will explore the various options for training neural networks using our latest GPUs. In particular, we will go over precisions and TensorCore capabilities, and how they can be leveraged to accelerate DL training workloads. Since there is a lot of content in this talk, first in place we break it down into three main parts that can be looked at in isolation. First, we will go over the basics on TensorCores and talk about a brand new TensorCore we introduced in our latest NVIDIA and third GPU architecture called TensorFlow32. Next, we will learn everything there is to know about mixed precision, the algorithm, how to use it, and new advances in both software and hardware. And lastly, we will quickly mention some accuracy considerations and discuss how to maximize performance when training with TensorCores. Okay, before we get started, let's take a quick look on the motivation for the topics discussed in this talk. The goal of this talk is to accelerate DL training, but why should we care about training networks faster? Over the past decade, training networks has become more and more expensive. For example, if we look at networks trained for image classification, in 2012, AlexNet was released and took five to six days to train on two GPUs. Five years later, ResNex 101 came out and that took 10 days to train on eight GPUs. And just last year, Noisy Student was training 1,000 GPUs for over a week. So we can see that the cost of training has increased substantially over the past decade. The situation is even worse for language tasks. There has been a big hype in language models ever since BERT was released two years ago. And new researchers found that training larger language models tend to give better results. So the size and cost to train them has grown exponentially since then. The figure in the right plus the time to train various language models as a function of their size and billions of parameters. Here the vertical axis represents the number of days it would take to train them on an exaflop computer. Note that the fastest supercomputer available today is only half an exaflop. We can see that BERT takes a few hours to train, but larger models like T5 and GPT-3 would take tens or hundreds of days. If you take a step back, the same thing happens on a smaller scale. For example, if you're a grad student or independent researcher training networks on one or two GPUs, something like ResNet or BERT may already start to pose a challenge. To address these issues, a lot of work is being done to slow down the increasing costs to train neural networks. One avenue has been to improve the hardware, so GPUs initially fueled the current AI or DL wave, but, then, but since then, DL-specific hardware has been invented, like tens of cores on GPUs, TPUs, and various A6 and FPGAs. Another approach has been to reduce the computation complexity, and there are several ways to accomplish this. You can adapt the network architecture, like making more compressed networks like mobile nets and efficient nets, or use compression techniques like, like reduced precision and sparsity. The focus of this talk will be on combining tensor cores, which is a hardware component, and reduce precision towards making DAO training more accessible. Since we'll be talking a lot about precision, let's have a quick overview on the basics. Fluent performance is a standard way to represent real numbers on a computer. There are many fluent point types out there, we have double, single, half precision, and so forth. Double precision FP64 is often used in scientific computing, where researchers need to perform very precise and accurate computations. Single precision can be used for things like gaming and graphics, where artists only need to make rough approximations of the world. In the context of deep learning, researchers and industry experts found that you can train neural networks with half the precision of FP32, of which there are many options, and we'll be going over the various precision used for DL in more details later in the talk. Since numbers cannot be stored with infinite precision on a computer, fluent performers make a trade-off between range and precision. On one hand, we want to represent values of widely different magnitudes, and we call this range. For example, when training a network, weights tend to have values around 1, grains have values much smaller than 1, and active values have values that are orders of magnitude larger. So a precision format should be capable of representing all of these tensors. The other part is that we want to provide the same relative accuracy at all magnitudes, and we call this precision. Now let's take a look at how a floating point number works. On the right, we show a diagram of how a number is represented in bits. Here we have a single precision FP32 number. It has one sign bit in blue, which indicates whether the number is positive or negative. Then it has eight exponent bits in green that determines the range of values in it, it can represent. You can think of the following representation as a scientific notation with a base of two, with exponent allows you to represent numbers like two, four, eight, 16, and so forth. The remaining 23 bits in red form the fraction, or Montessa, which determines the relative precision between the exponents. The Montessa gives you samples between powers of two, in particular, there will be two to the number of Montessa bits of samples between exponent values. For example, at the illustration below, we have exponents of 2, 4, and 8, 
where the Montesa is used to represent values between 4 and 8, like 5, 6, and 7. Note that both the exponent and Montesa are important for network training. More exponent bits allow you to represent a wider range of values, so smaller and larger magnitudes, while more Montesa gives you more precision between nearby values, like precision of values around 1, where the weight magnitudes typically exist. Later in this talk, we will see what trade-offs between exponent and Montessa are made when moving to half precision used for DL. Now let's get started. In this section, we'll be going over some basics about tensor cores, tensor core options available in the A100 GPU, and all you need to know about TensorFlow 32 and how to use it to accelerate your single precision DL training workloads. As we mentioned earlier, DL training is becoming prohibitively expensive. This is where tensor cores come in. Tensor cores are specialized hardware execution units that were introduced in our last generation of GPUs, Volta, to accelerate DL training. They perform matrix and convolution operations, which represent the most fundamental and time-consuming operations for most DL workloads. Tensor cores perform vector instructions, which are very different from your regular scale FP32 cores. For example, let's assume we are multiplying two matrices A and B, as shown below, which is a basic operation that a tensor core does. Using FP32 cores, the GPU will multiply scalar element of the A matrix with the scalar element of the B matrix, and the result is added to another product using a single instruction. The GPU will repeat the scalar instruction for all elements of the matrix, and distribute the work across thousands of, of FP32 cores on our GPUs. Tensor cores, on the other hand, operate on vectors of elements at a time. That means we multiply an entire vector of values using a single matrix instruction. In particular, Tensor cores perform multiplying and cumulative operations on small matrices. Our GPUs have hundreds of these tensor core units, which in concert can multiply larger matrices much faster than FP32 cores. One key component of tensor cores is that they can take inputs of different data types for acceleration. This is where reduced precision comes into play, as we will learn more about later. Compared to scale FP32 operations, tensor cores are 8 to 16 times faster, or up to 32x faster with sparsity and they're also more energy efficient. Tensor cores come in many different flavors in the latest NVIDIA Ampere GPU architecture. There are floating point types, which are used for DL and HPC applications. These include tensor cores with 16-bit inputs, FP16 was introduced in Volta, while A100 adds more variety to 16-bit options with B416, another popular format used for DL. There are tensor cores with 32-bit inputs, such as our newly introduced TF32 and A100 for training our networks in single precision, and their tensor cores with 64-bit inputs, which are mostly used for scientific computing. We also have tensor cores with integer types for quantized DL inference, such as int8, int4, and int1, which are supported in both Volta and A100. Lastly, A100 introduces sparsity to tensor cores, which is not exactly a type, but is also used to accelerate DL inference. Our sparsity comes in 2 to 4 fine-grained structure, where two elements out of every four element vector in a matrix are zero. Now let's talk about the various tensor core options we have for DL training. There are two ways to accelerate network training with the tensor core hardware. One is single precision training with TensorFlow 32 mode, which is a brand new tensor core in A100. It only accelerates math limit operations. Remember that tensor cores perform matrix multiplies and convolutions. Compared to FP32 training, which uses regular FP32 cores, TF32 has eight times higher math throughput for math operations and the same memory bandwidth pressure, since all of the tensors are stored in single precision. A major benefit of TF32 is that you get to leverage tensor core acceleration without making any changes to the training scripts. This is because we've made TF32 the default math mode for single precision training on the NVIDIA Ampere GPU architecture. The second option for training is to use 16-bit formats for mixed precision training on either V100 or A100. This remains the fastest option for DL training, because it accelerates both math and memory limited operations. Here, 16-bit tensor cores are used to accelerate matrix multiplies and convolutions, while 16-bit types are used to accelerate other parts of the network, like normalization and pointwise operations. Compared to FP32 training, it has 16 times higher math throughputs, twice that of TF32 for tensor cores, and halves the memory bandwidth pressure, since only half the amount of data needs to be accessed. Unlike TF32, it does require some changes to training scripts, mainly FP32 weight storage, layer selection, and loss scaling, which reduces to just a few lines of model code when using automatic mix precision or AMP software. The way to think about TF32 is as a tensor core option for single precision training. 
One important distinction is that TF32 is a tensor core mode and not a type like 16 bit formats. This means that only convolution and matrix multiplies will convert their inputs to TF32. All other operations and network layers remain completely in single precision. Also, all storage and memory remains in FP32 as usual. As a result, TF32 is only exposed as a tensor core operation mode, which is in contrast to FP16 and B416 that are natural types and provide data storage, various math operators, and more. A simple example would be as follows. With 16 bits, you can define a tensor of type FP16 or B416 in the model code. With TF32, you can only pass it in as an option when executing matrix multiplies and convolutions. On the bottom right, we show the basic operations that a TF32 tensor core performs. It first reads in FP32 inputs from GPU memory. Then it will round those inputs to TF32 before the tensor core operation, which we'll talk more about in the next slide. Next, it multiplies the rounded inputs without loss of precision. It will accumulate the partial dot products in FP32. And finally, the FP32 output will, will be written out to memory. One thing to notice is that the FP32 inputs and outputs is what allows us to leverage tensor core acceleration while training networks in single precision. We saw in the previous slide that the tensor core rounds the FP32 inputs to TF32. In this slide, we will describe exactly what that mean. On the right, we show the various dial precision options. There is FP32 and TF32 for single precision training, and a 16 bit formats FP16 and B416 for mixed precision. Comparing TF32 to the other precision options, we can make a few observations. TF32 has an 8 8-bit exponent that matches FP32, which means it can cover the same range of values as single precision. TF32 also has a 10-bit mantissa. If you remember from the floating point basics earlier in the talk, a 10-bit mantissa means we can present 2 to the 10 or 1024 samples between powers of 2. This is more precision than B416. For example, BF16 has a 7-bit mantissa that can present 128 samples, which means TF32 has 8 times more samples or precision than B416. It also has the same amount of Montessa as FP16, and that remains its only difference from FP32. One thing to note is that this Montessa has been shown to be a sufficient margin for the training, as all networks trained by us with FP16 match FP32 accuracy. And TF32 is mathematically provable as good or better than 16 bit precisions. We also performed direct empirical studies across 80 plus networks to further confirm that the losses and accuracies match that of FP32. We also want to test that TF32 works out of the box on unmodified model scripts. So we're experimenting with 80 plus networks covering a wide range of model architectures like GovNets, MLPs, RNNs, Transformers, BERT, GANs, and many more. On diverse tasks like image tasks for classification detection and gauge estimation, language tasks for translation and language modeling, recommenders, meta learning, as well as some more niche tasks like logic reasoning where you're trying to solve a problem without pre-baking the rules of the game or combinatorial solvers for pathfinding algorithms and shortest path, as well as things like first and second order methods. In all cases and experiments, we found that TF32 matches FP32 accuracy and loss values. Before we dive into some accuracy results, let's have a quick look on run-to-run -run variation. DL networks are known to have run-to-run -run variance during training, and what that really means is that our results, so our accuracy and loss values, can vary between different runs of the same model. There are many reasons for this, such as different seeds which may affect weight initialization, dropout, and other layers in the network that rely on random states, operational use atomics, the idea here is that changing the order of flowing point operations, such as additions, may produce different results. This can include operations such as indexing or scatter functions. Another reason could be quotidian heuristics of algorithms, as certain options are less deterministic, but we can control that as well. And lastly, differences in the software stack so changes in the containers, frameworks, and external libraries can all cause variations in the results. But various of the frameworks have documentation on determinism and how to make training experiments more reproducible. Now let's go over an example on Destiny 201 for image classification. We train a network with six different seeds using both FP32 and TF32. On the right, we visualize the results in various ways. On the top plot, we show the top one axis sorted from smallest to largest, where the horizontal axis represents the rank. On the bottom, we make a scatter plot of the accuracies. Note that there's quite a lot of run to run variation. FP32 accuracies varies by up to 0.5 percentage points, and this number can be even higher for other workloads. In both cases, TF32 results in green look indistinguishable from FP32 in black. Also, if we compute their statistics, we find that they are statistically equivalent with the same mean and medians. The main takeaway here is that run to run variations exist 
and slight difference in results are expected if they are within a statistical margin of error. Here we show a sampling of the deep learning workloads we have trained in TF32. This covers a wide range of networks for various tasks. On the table on the left, we have image classification tasks on various ResNet architectures, TenseNets, VGG, and also compressed networks like EfficientNet. On the middle, we show results for detection and segmentation tasks on various masker CNN and faster CNN architectures and single shot detectors. And on the right, there are results for language tasks, mainly machine translation and language modeling, covering a, a broad spectrum of transformer, convolutional, and recurrent architectures. Looking at the numbers in detail, we observe that TF32 matches FP32 accuracy and loss in all scenarios. Note that all of these runs were without any change to hyperparameters, and any differences in accuracy are within your typical bounds of run-to-run -run variations. For example, if we look at the results for ResNet32 and ResNet50 at the upper left corner, we can observe two things. One is that TF32 has marginally better results than FP32 on ResNet32, but marginally worse results on ResNet50. Since these differences are within 0.05 of a percentage point, they can be attributed to noise as described in the previous slide. To further confirm that TF32 truly gives the same result as FP32, let's look at the evolution of loss and inaccuracies during training for a couple of networks. Here we consider the ResNex 101 train on ImageNet for image classification. We plot the training loss on the left and top one accuracy on the test set on the right as a function of training epochs denoted by the horizontal axis. In both metrics, we can conclude that TF32 training curves in green match FP32 training in black. Here we consider Masker CNN with the ResNet 101 backbone trained on the COCO dataset for detection and segmentation tasks. On the left, we can observe that the losses for TF32 and a single precision training match. On the right, we plot the detection and segmentation mean average precisions over all region sizes and thresholds. The TF32 results also match those of single precision training. Next, we cover language modeling with Transformer Excel. We plot the perplexity, which is a measure that indicates the quality of the language model as a function of training iterations, and also find that TF32 training curves, where lower is better, match that of single precision training. And finally, we have experiments that are readily available in our NGC containers and deep learning examples. We show loss curves for FP32, TF32, and mixed precision training with FP16. On the left, we have ResNet50 trained in TensorFlow, and on the right, we have BERT large pre training on PyTorch. In both cases, all of the experiments match within run to run variation. So if you have an annual 100, you can produce these experiments on the available software stack. We talked a bit about how TF32 matches single precision training. Now let's take a look at what kind of performance we can achieve on real training workloads. Here we have a sample of training speedups going from the default math on Volta, which is single precision, to TF32 on A100. We cover a broad range of network architectures, including transformers, recurrent networks, and convolutional models. The green bars represent speedups for various workloads. We can see that overall networks train between 2 to 6 times faster on A100 compared to Volta, with no changes to the model code. Transformer-based architectures have the highest speedups, around 4 to 6x. Next are recurrent networks that are over three times faster than previous generation hardware. And last, we have convolutional models that are roughly twice as fast on A100. And just to put these numbers in perspective, what would take a month to train on Volta with single precision can now take as, a li as little as a couple of days on A100. On A100, TF32 is a default math option for neural network training. This means we can leverage tensor core acceleration and obtain up to 6x speedups on real DL workloads without making any changes to the model code. TF32 is supported for all the major frameworks, including TensorFlow, PyTorch, and MXNet, in our NVIDIA container releases, starting with versions 2006 and above. Support in upstream frameworks is currently in progress. Also, FP32 paths remain the default for non-DL operations, such as for HPC applications, as well as any use of gems in the solver operations in the frameworks. TF32 is enabled for convolution and matrix multiply layers, including linear and fully connected layers, recurrent cells, and the tension blocks when the inputs are in single precision. TF32 is not enabled for convolution or matrix multiply layers that operate on non-FP32 tensors, such as 16 bits with FP64, or on any layers that are not convolutions or matrix multiplies. For example, you can't apply tensor cores to batch normalization, and they don't apply to optimizers and solve operations. We also introduce a global platform control for TF32. This is a global variable called NVIDIA TF32 override which allows users to toggle TF32 mode at a system level and thus override the library and framework settings. If the flag is set to zero, it will disable TF32 so that FP32 is used for all convolutional and matrix multiplies. If the flag is not set, 
then a behavior defaults to a library and framework settings. This flag is mainly available as a debugging tool to provide a quick way to rule out any concern regarding TF32 libraries and allow users to focus on other issues. Now let's explain the behavior of TF32 in our various libraries. Note this information is mostly useful for framework developers as well as researchers who use NVIDIA libraries directly. CUDNN is our deep neural network library that's mainly used for convolutions. Starting with CUDNN versions 8 and greater, TF32 is going to be the default math mode for convolutions, which means TF32 kernels will be selected and executed on tensor cores when operating on 32 bit data. Kublas is our library for linear algebra operations, like matrix multiplies. Here, the default math mode remains in FP32 because of HPC applications, which tend to require more precision. But starting with Kublas versions 11 and greater, TF32 can be enabled when the math mode is set to Kublas TF tensor op math. Note, however, that certain operations, like solvers, need to be kept in single precision. We accomplish this in the DL frameworks by placing guards around such operations, mainly caching the current Kublas state, setting Kublas math mode to FP32, executing the solve operation in FP32 math, and then restoring the original Kublas state. To summarize single precision training on N100, it's a great starting point if you've been training FP32 on Volta and other processors and don't have any experience with mixed precision. A100 hardware can deliver up to an order of magnitude speedup over Volta. The FL2 tensor cores are on by default, so they require no changes to the model scripts. And as we've seen before, the FL2 training achieves the same loss behavior and accuracy as FP32 training. Now that we have gone over some basics on tensor cores and TensorFlow32 for single precision training, let's take a look at mixed precision training with 16 bit formats. Here we will be exploring the available hardware, the mixed precision algorithm, as well as practical examples on using mixed precision in frameworks and model code. Tensor cores for 16 bit formats were first introduced in Volta and then further extended in A100. On the right, we illustrate the basic tensor core operation. Note that unlike TF32, which operates on FP32 data, these tensor cores multiply and add FP16 or BF16 tensors. It first reads in 16 bit inputs from memory. The products are then computed without loss of precision and accumulated in FP32. The final FP32 output is then rounded to FP16 or B416 before writing out to memory. The NVIDIA Ampere GPU architecture comes with several enhancements over Volta. It has a new tensor core design, which through various architecture improvements delivers 2.5x more throughput than FP16 on Volta. It also has sparse support, which is an additional 2x throughput for sparse operations, that means 5 times faster than V100 tensor cores. And it's expanded support for 16-bit types with B416, another popular DL precision format, which performs at the same rate as FP16 tensor cores. Now, let's take a look at what is mixed precision training. When we introduced tensor cores in Volta, we also needed a way to use them for deep learning. So we adopted this concept called mixed precision to train neural networks with tensor cores. The main idea behind mixed precision is to combine single precision, or FP32, with lower precision, like FP16 or BFlow16, to train a neural network. We use, we use lower precision where applicable, such as for tensor corporations like convolutions and matrix multiplies. And we keep certain operation FP32, where it doesn't really make sense to use lower precision. We illustrate an example in the figure below. Here the nodes represent different network layers, and arrows are the direction that the data is flowing through a network. The green nodes are computing lower precision, while nodes in white, like the loss function, are left in full precision. By combining multiple precisions to train a network, we can achieve the same accuracy as FP32 training using all the same hyperparameters. There are various benefits of training mixed precision. One is that it accelerates math-intensive operations with specialized hardware, like GPU tensor cores. FP16 and BF16 tensor cores have 16 times higher math throughput than FP32 cores, which allows us to accelerate layers like convolutions and matrix multiplies. Second, it accelerates memory-intensive operations by reducing memory traffic, as 16-bit formats require half the number of bytes to be read and written to memory. This can be used to accelerate layers that are bound by memory accesses, such as normalizations, activation functions, and more. And lastly, mixed precision reduces memory requirements. 16 bits reduces storage of activations and gradient tensors, which enables us to train larger models for better accuracy, as well as use larger mini batches and larger inputs. Note that the second two benefits are unique to 16 bit mixed precision training and not offered by TF32. The main reason is that TF32 accelerates single precision training where all the tensor data remains in FP32. So we spend a lot of time on memory limited layers, or wish to leverage memory savings, then mixed precision is a good option. Mixed precision training is general purpose, 
There have been over three years of networks trained with 16-bit formats, both FP16 and B416. It's been proven to match FP32 results across a wide range of tasks, problem domains, and deep neural network architectures. Here we have a small list of networks trained in mixed precision, just to show the sheer diversity of the workloads, the network's framework classification, detection segmentation, recommenders, generative models, speech, language tasks, and many more not listed. So we can see that mixed precision has become standard practice for accelerating deep learning in both academic and industry settings. Now let's take a look at what performance can be achieved with mixed precision on real training workloads. Here we have a sample of achieved training speedups on various networks, ranging from transformer-based like BERT and Excel, to RNNs like JNMT, to covnets like Resin50 and SSZ. The dark green bars indicate training speedups from single precision FP32 to mixed precision with FP16 tensor cores on Volta. And the light green bars indicate how much faster is training when using A100 mixed precision. We can observe that mixed precision on Volta is between two to six times faster than single precision training. And then moving from Volta to A100 FP16 tensor cores delivers another two to three X of improvements. Overall, networks train up to an order of magnitude faster on A100 mixed precision compared to Volta FP32. Just to put these numbers in perspective, that means what would take a month to train on Volta with FP32, we can train in two to three days on A100 with a new generation of tensor cores. Over the past few years, mixed precision has led to a lot of success stories. For generative models, mixed precision has improved the performance of GOGAN, which is a popular GAN model that converts doodles into artistic images. Mixed precision speeds up training by more than 2x, which reduces development cycles when exploring new architectures and hyperparameters. Memory settings for mixed precision also allow researchers to train larger generative models to improve visual quality as well as process higher as images. For computer vision, Mixed precision is being used as a default training option by a number of customers, observing 2 to 3x faster training and employing mixed precision on numerous workloads. In the context of machine translation, mixed precision allowed Facebook to speed up their FASIC library by 5x due to faster math and larger batch training. And lastly, we have language models, where mixed precision is fueling research on state of the art natural language processing. As we've discussed earlier, the size and cost of training language models is increasing at, at an unprecedented rate. In less than a year, we've gone from Megatron to Turian LP to GPT-3, which represents over an order of magnitude increase in model size. The reduced training times and memory savings from 16-bit formats have enabled researchers to train such models, which simply would not have been possible in single precision training. These are just a few examples to give an idea of the research that has been made possible with mixed precision technology and tensor core hardware. Now let's describe the mixed precision algorithm which was introduced in a seminal work published by NVIDIA in 2017. Mixed precision was developed with two goals in mind. One is we want to make mixed precision training general purpose. We want to work everywhere and not only for a limited class of applications. And second, we want to do so without making any changes to hyperparameters or network architecture. FP16 and BF16 16-bit formats can be applied to any operations, so there are three considerations we need to take. One is layer selection, so we need to decide which operations to compute in FP32 and which you can compute in 16-bit formats. Second is weight storage. We need to keep the model weights and their updates in single precision. And third is loss scaling. We need to retain small gray magnitudes for FP16. Over the next couple of slides, we'll be going over each one of these three components of the mixed precision algorithm in more details. First, let's talk about layer selection. When you're training a neural network, there can be hundreds of operations being called. And the question remains which operations should be computed in low precision and which should be kept in full precision. We can divide a set of all possible operations into two kinds. Matrix multiplies, like linear layers, patch times, and convolutions. These are math bound operations that can leverage A to 16x acceleration from FP16 and BF16 tensor cores. Then we have everything else, so reductions, loss functions, activation functions, and more. These are operations that cannot use tensor cores and are not very math heavy, so they're going to be bound by memory accesses. Here we can get up to 2x acceleration with 16 bit formats but we should be careful not to do so at the cost of accuracy. Here are some conservative recommendations regarding layer selection that are integrated into our AMP software, of which we'll talk more about later. Operations that can use 16-bit storage, so FP16 or BF16, include matrix multiplications because they can leverage tensor cores, and most of your polymerized operations and activation functions. Then we have operations that need more precision or Mantissa, such as FP32 or FP16. This is mainly because adding small values to large sums can lead to large rounding errors because of how full implementation works. 
and these are typically found in reduction operations like summations and normalization functions. And then we have operations in more range, so either FP32 or BF16. These are typically pointwise operations where the output of your function is much larger than its input, such as a logarithm or power function, and they're typically found in loss computations. The next part of the mixed precision algorithm involves weight storage and updates. Let's assume we're doing a simple update as shown below, where w of t plus 1 is a new weight, w of t is the old weight, alpha is a learning rate, and nabla t is a weight gradient. The issue is that weight updates can become too small for addition in FP16 and BFlog16 during late stage of training. This occurs when updates get clipped to zero because the weight was much larger than the update itself, either because the weight became too large, or the learning rate became too small, or the weight gradient was too small. This, this is mostly a result of how flowing point addition works, as illustrated below. Here we have a weight w at 1, and the next nearest representable value is dictated by the Montessa, which gives us the precision, or the number of samples between two exponents. Remember when we talked about precision earlier, if we have m bits of Montessa, then the nearest representable value will be 1 over 2 to the m. For fp16 with 10 bits of Montessa, the nearest value is 1 over 2 to the 10, or 1 over 1024. While for bf16 with 7 bits of Montessa, the nearest value is 8 times larger. The issue arises when the update is much below the next representable value, and the result rounds back to the original weight value itself. For training, that means when the update gets too small, they stop having an effect on the model weights, and training stalls, which can affect accuracy. Our conservative solution is to keep weights and perform updates in FP32, so that these small updates can accumulate across iterations. Here we show how FP32 weight storage and updates are typically implemented in frameworks. The weights are always stored in FP32, so during the forward pass, we will make an FP16 copy of the weights, so they can be ingested by tens of corporations, like linear layers and convolutional layers. This also depends on the framework implementation. Sometimes the casting is done right when the operation is called instead of upfront. FP16 weights and activations will then flow through the model. During a backward pass, FP16 grains are generated, after which to optimize will convert them to FP32 and perform the weight updates in single precision to avoid losing small updates. And then the entire process is repeated for the next iteration. The last component of the mixed precision algorithm involves keeping tensors within a representable range. During training, we find that weights, activations, and gradients can have a wide range of values, as shown on the right. Here we can see that weights and activations typically have much larger magnitudes than their corresponding gradients. In blue, we show the representable range in FP16. What happens during training is that gradients have become too small, as shown in the red region, are lost or flushed to zero. This can affect network accuracy, as these very small gradients are no longer backpropagated through a network. But notice that most of the range in green remains completely unused. This implies it's not a dynamic range problem, but rather an unfortunate positioning of the gradients in the FP16 range. So the solution so far has been to move the small gradient values to the represented by FP16 range. We can do that by multiplying the loss by constant factor, such that all the gradients are scaled or shifted to the right by chain rule. Here we see how we can keep tensors within the representable range with loss scaling when training a model in frameworks. We first make a forward pass of the model, then scale the loss and back propagate the scaled FP16 gradients, which are within the FP16 representable range. Lastly, we unscale the gradients before any grain clipping and call in the optimizer weight update. The issue with loss scaling is that the ideal loss scaling factor may change for different workloads, such as convolutional models versus language models. So the solution was to automate the process, which we call automatic loss scaling. The algorithm starts with a very large scale factor, such as the maximum FP16 value. The reason is that we always want to keep the gradients in the maximum possible range, to reduce how many values underflow. Then if the gradients overflow with an int or a nan, we decrease the scale by 2 and skip that update. If no overflows has occurred for some time, for example after 2000 iterations, then the scale is increased again by a factor of 2. Below we show the evolution of the loss scaling factor during network training. We can see that initially the scale drops because it starts from a very large value, causing all the gradients to overflow, but after some time it stabilizes, allowing small grain values to be retained. To use mixed precision, we need to make changes to the model code. In particular, we need to enforce the 16-bit precision format so we can actually leverage acceleration from the tensor core hardware. Remember that 16-bit tensor cores require the inputs to be in 16-bit format. 
This is where our automatic mix precision, or AMP, software comes into play. AMP was designed to make mix precision training with FP16 in frameworks as easy as possible, and it automates the three steps we just described for training mix precision, layer selection, weight storage, and loss scaling. So for example, AMP will convert matrix multiplies and convolutions to 16 bits for tensor core acceleration. AMP works with multiple models, optimizers, and losses, and it's available for all the major frameworks, including AMXNet, PyTorch, and TensorFlow. To enable AMP in frameworks, we just need to make a few changes to model code. For TensorFlow, AMP is available in NVIDIA Container 1907, as well as TensorFlow 1 and 2. For PyTorch, NIV support was, was recently added to PyTorch 1.6, and it's available in NVIDIA Container 2006. And for AMXNet, AMP is available in NVIDIA Container 1904 and AMXNet 1.5. More documentation can be found in the links below. Next, we'll be going over more details on how to enable AMP in the various frameworks. AMP is available for TensorFlow via two APIs. The first one is using the Graph Op Optimization API. This is a recommended choice for using AMP in TensorFlow 1. Here it's available as a wrapper to the optimizer. Once the graph is constructed, an optimization pass to the graph will convert the type of certain FP32 operations to FP16 in the TensorFlow backend, following the recommendations for layer selection we described earlier. The optimizer will also apply automatic loss scaling for scaling the loss. Below is an example for how to enable AMP in the model code. Basically, it only amounts to wrapping the optimizer with an enable mixed precision graph rewrite function as shown in green. The other way to use AMP for TensorFlow is using the Keras Mixed Precision API. This is a recently released API and it's a recommended option for AMP in TensorFlow 2.x. The main benefit is that it gives the user the ability to control precision as a model is constructed in Python, which can be used for both graph and eager execution modes. When training models with the model.fit function, a policy is defined that determines the type of layer computation and layer variables. For example, mixed float 16 uses FP16 computations and FP32 variables, since the weight storage should be FP32 as dictated by the mixed precision algorithm. We can also override the policy and type of layers that we believe are not numerically stable in FP16 by specifying the D-type of that particular layer. In the example below, the softmax layer is set to type flow32. This is to say we can have multiple policies for a given model. Model of fit internally deals with automatic loss scaling, but if we train the model with a custom training loop, then we need to explicitly apply the loss scaling when using the mixed precision policy. For MXNet, we can enable mixed precision training by making three changes to the model code. First, we initialize AMP by changing the behavior and types of operations, according to a layer selection defined by mixed precision algorithm. Then we wrap the glow and trainer with the AMP in the trainer function. And lastly, we apply automatic loss scaling to preserve small gradients. We accomplish this by scaling the loss through the AMP context manager and calling backwards on the scaled loss. This way, all the grains will be shifted to their FP16 representable range. For PyTorch, AMP is available to two APIs. AMP was originally released in our Apex extension for PyTorch, but since then, native automatic mix precision has been added to the framework and is now the recommended option. Here, we will go over the Apex version for those who prefer to use it. The API for Apex AMP is very similar to that of MXNet. First, we wrap the model and optimizer with an AMP initialize function that patches operations so that they cast the correct type. For example, FP32 inputs to a tensor core operation will be converted to FP16, and vice versa, an FP16 input to an FP32 operation will be cast to single precision. The opt level argument specifies whether FP32, mixed precision, or pure FP16 training is used. The recommended option is to always leave it at 01. Second, we apply automatic loss scaling with the AMP context manager as described earlier. As we just mentioned, PyTorch now has native automatic mixed precision integration in the framework, starting with its 1.6 release, which is available in NVIDIA containers 206 and greater. To ensure the best user experience, we test the native AMP on roughly 40 networks for accuracy and performance. We will also have it available in all of the NVIDIA deep learning examples soon. Native AMP implements a mixed precision algorithm in two separate components, autocasting, which is used for layer selection, and grad scalar for dealing with the weight storage and updates, as well as automatic loss scaling. On the right is a code example for how to integrate native AMP into the model code. First, we create a grad scalar object once at the beginning of training. We can create multiple of these if we want to have different ones per optimizer, but one global scalar was always found to be sufficient for training. 
Next, in the training loop, we wrap the model's forward pass with autocast. This will cast operations with mixed precision, such that most operations will be computed in FP16, but some will be kept in FP32. It also gives us a lot of flexibility to decide where do we apply mixed precision in our models. Next, we scale the loss and call backwards on the scale loss to move the gradient to the FP16 range. We then call the scalar step function to apply the optimizer. And lastly, we update the loss scale for the next iteration. We mentioned earlier that A100 introduces BF16 to a 16-bit tensor course. So let's review how BF16 can be used in the various libraries for A100. The motivation here is that if we're training networks with BF16, we can now use the libraries to leverage tensor core acceleration for matrix multiplies and the native CUDA type to reduce memory traffic for custom layers. B416 is accessible in the following ways in CUDA 11. There are low-level PTX MMA instructions that can be used for tensor core operations, or you can use them via the WMMA API. BF16 is now also available as a native CUDA C type called NVB416. And BF16 tensor cores can be used through various of the CUDA math libraries, such as CUBLAS, CUSOLVER, and more. So they can be called directly when developing framework code. Just a quick note on conversions for 16 bit formats. We recommend avoiding custom conversions because they are bug prone, as the floating point rounding is complex and has many corner cases. Instead, we recommend using typecasts or intrinsic functions that are readily available in CUDA. To use the native types and casts, we must include the proper headers as shown in the code below. So for FP16, we include CUDA underscore FP16.h and cast a type as half. Whereas for B416, we include CUDA underscore BF16.h and cast the variables as NVB416. To summarize mixed precision training on E100, it's a good option if we have already used mixed precision training, FP16 or BF16 on Volta or other processors, since there is no effort in moving to A100. Or if we're using single precision on A100 training and want further speed ups because models still take too long to train, or if we need memory savings to train larger models or fit larger inputs. Mixed precision remains the fastest option for training, where 16 bit tensor cores are up to 2x faster than single precision with TF32. And we also accelerate all the layers in the network. It requires minimal additions to training scripts using our AMP software and has no impact on accuracy when compared to FP32. For the last part of this talk, we'll go over some accuracy considerations when using AMP and provide tips for profiling and maximizing tensor core performance. There are various reasons for running into issues when training mixed precision. The vast majority of them are due to implementation pitfalls when using AMP. Here we'll go over a couple of common mistakes we've encountered in the past. The first one involves casting tensors to 16 bits. There are instances where tensors or parts of the model are cast to half or full 16. This can happen for two reasons. One is the hope of improving performance, and two is to fix some type mismatch when running the model. An issue with manual cast is that it converts the model weight to FP16, which may con cause convergence problems during late stages of training when the weight updates become too small for 16 bits. Instead, the recommendation is to always avoid manual casts, as AMP keeps FP32 weight storage and, and ensures operations that are safe are computed in FP16. Another common mistake is when working with scaled gradients. Gradients after the backward pass are scaled due to, to the scaled loss, so they can affect subsequent computations involving gradients if not handled properly. The correct behavior is to unscale the gradients for any operations that use the gradients, such as gradient clipping. For native AMP on PyTorch, we can do that using the unscale function from the grad scale object as follows, after which operations on the gradients are safe to use. The last reason for numeric instability involves not checkpointing and resuming the loss scale factor. This typically happens when the AMP loss scale factor is not properly saved or loaded into the model script. The way automatic loss scaling works is that it starts from a very high loss scale, which then decreases throughout training. So it's unlikely that the loss scale factor after sufficient training will be the same as in the beginning. It's therefore crucial to store the AMP loss scale and continue training from the same factor, much like learning rates are resumed. In PyTorch, we can accomplish this with a few lines of code as shown below. The main takeaway from this slide is that if any issues are observed when training makes precision, it's likely that one of the mistakes above was made. For the rest of this talk, we'll be covering performance aspects of tensor core training. As we've seen earlier, training speedups with TF32 or mixed precision vary a lot across workloads. The reason for this is that the end-to-end -end performance depends a lot on the training composition. Below we show time breakdowns for typical single precision and mixed precision training. 
In both cases, training can be broken down into work that's done on a GPU, in green, and work on a CPU, in gray. The GPU work can be further broken down between math limited operations, like matched multiplies and convolutions, and memory limited operations, which consists of all other layers in your network. The CPU work often includes things like data pipeline, communication, and so forth. In mixed precision training, notice that only the green portions or GPU work will be reduced. Math operations can go up to 8 to 16 times faster with tensor cores, while memory operations can be observed up to 2x speed ups with 16 bit formats. However, notice that CPU work in gray remains constant and dominates execution time, which limits overall speed up to 2x in this case. This behavior is what we call Amdahl's law. If we speed up a part of the training session or GPU work in green, then the remaining parts, or the CPU work in gray, will limit the overall performance. Now let's talk about how to improve the training performance. There's no single recommendation, as perfect applications will vary a lot across deep learning workloads. Instead, we will take a top-down approach and explain three levels of profiling to understand and improve training performance. At the top level, we can profile the training session as a whole, with the goal of finding how much time is spent on the GPU. Remember that mixed precision only accelerates GPU work, so if most of the training is spent on the CPU, then the speedups will be fairly low. We can also measure the time spent on different high-level components of the network, such as the forward and backward paths, losses, and optimizer. Next, we profile the network layers, with the goal of finding the time breakdown of different layer types. For example, how much time is spent on layers that do matrix math? The reason for this is that tensor core have the largest performance benefits in training, so we want to make sure enough time is being spent on those kinds of layers. And lastly, we can profile tensor core performance and make sure that tensor cores are being used and achieve good efficiency. So for the rest of this talk, we'll be diving into each one of these profiling levels in more detail and provide some useful tips. Before we get started, let's take a quick look at the profiling tools. To profile neural networks, we recommend using NVIDIA's Deep Learning Profiler, which was designed for analyzing performance of neural networks on deep learning frameworks. It provides layers of breakdown of network time by correlating GPU kernels or functions to actual layers in the network. And it can help determine ages of the limit performance. For example, it can tell us whether we are using tensor cores for a particular layer. The deep learning profile is available for TensorFlow 1 and PyTorch on NVIDIA containers. And it's a one liner to use by wrapping the command line with the dlprof command and potentially visualizing the output profile on TensorBoard. For PyTorch, we also have to add the following lines of code to the model script. Most deep learning profiles are pretty heavyweight with a lot of features that are framework specific. For this reason, we've also introduced a simple mode to a deep learning profiler, which is an easy, use, easy to use profiler that can profile any program or Python script and is completely agnostic to the frameworks. This can be particularly useful for DL and ML researchers who are using other DL frameworks or writing custom code. The profiler provides three basic metrics for understanding mixed precision performance, as shown below. The total walk clock time, which is the amount of time spent on an entire training session. The total GPU time, which is the time spent on GPU work. And the total tensor core kernel time, which is the time spent executing tensor cores. We can learn more about this simple option, as well as the full featured deep learning profiler on the links below. The first thing we want to do is profile the training session as a whole and find a fraction of time being spent on the GPU. The GPU time can be obtained using DLProf in full or simple mode, as shown in the previous slide. We can also profile different portions of the model code by inserting Python timers. So in the example below, we start a timer and then we run forward and backward passes of the model. Note that before we compute the elapsed time, we execute the CUDA synchronous to wait for the GPU work to complete, as it runs asynchronously to a whole CPU, which is calling the timers. There are a few things to keep in mind when profiling network training. We want to skip measurements for the first few iterations that may be slower due to memory allocation, library heuristics, or graph compilation. We also want to average time over tens of iterations to account for variation in the input mini batches. And lastly, we want to compute speedups over the same mini batches for FP32 and single pre MX precision training. Now let's assume we profile the network and find that a lot of time is being spent on the CPU. For example, if we spend half of the time on GPU work, that means we can't get more than 2x speed up even if that time was reduced to zero. There are several reasons why that might happen. Some common pitfalls include small batches or layer dimensions that don't saturate the GPU resources, such as tensor cores. Basically, we need to ensure that there is enough work to fill up the GPU, 
This is especially true for newer hardware like A100, which has more cores. Another reason is if there are unoptimized portions of the model code, so the slow data processing or loss computations that are executed on the CPU or NumPy. Once we've made sure enough of the training time is being spent on a GPU, the next thing we want to look at are the network layers. Here, training speedup will depend a lot on the network composition. Network computation can be broken down into two types. There are memory bound layers. These layers can be accelerated with 16 bit formats, as we can get up to 2x speedups from the reduced memory traffic. Most of the network layers will fall in this category, such as losses, activation functions, normalizations, and more. Next, we have math bound layers. These are layers that can be accelerated with TF32, FP16, and BF16 tensor cores. We can get up to 8 to 16x speedups from the faster matrix math. And they typically include linear convolutional layers, matrix multiplies, and batch gems. We can use DLProf to find a time breakdown of the network, as DLProf correlates kernels or functions executed on the GPU with actual network operations and layers. On the right, we show the layer breakdown for a GAN model for both FP32 and AMP. We show the cumulative time spent on each layer type, the percentage of total time, as well as speedos from FP32 to mix precision. We also break them down between math bound layers, which consists of convolutions, and memory bound layers. Next, let's go over a simple example. Here we profile our BERT large pre training on a single V100 and show the time breakdown between network layers for single precision training in gray and mixed precision training in green. Looking at, at, at FP32 time, we can notice that most of the time is spent on the linear layer, which is a math bound operation. When we switch to AMP, we can get pretty good speedups from these math bound layers because of tensor cores. The rest of the network layers, such as softmax, drop button, layer norm, are memory bound and we can observe up to 2x speedups if they are computed in 16 bits. To conclude, we can get a good end to end performance of over 3x because of the tensor core speedup. So, the general recommendation is to have the network spend more time on math bound layers where tensor cores can be used. Once we've made sure that most of the training time is spent on GPU and that math bound layers are predominant, the last thing we want to profile are the tensor cores themselves. First, we want to make sure that tensor cores are actually being used. We can check tensor core usage using the D NVIDIA Deep Learning Profiler, as shown in the illustrations. The profile gives us two bits of information. First, it tells us the cumulative time spent on nodes or layers that are using tensor cores, as well as operations that did not use tensor cores but could have. An example would be a linear layer with a poor choice of dimensions. Second, it gives us information about individual layers, where we can check whether tensor cores were used and whether the input satisfied the tensor core constraints. Using this information, we can find out how much percentage of total time was spent on tensor core math and pinpoint potential layers that can be further optimized by enabling tensor cores. Once we made sure that tensor cores are actually being used, we can then check their efficiency. The typical use case here would be if only a few layers are dominating the training time. We can then make a tour example of those layers. For example, below have an example of a linear layer in PyTorch. We can profile the code snippet using any size compute which is the next generation of profiles for CUDA applications, using the command line below. The profiler will output the information shown below, which gives us the name of the kernel executed on the GPU and its metric value. The metric tells us how much were the tensor cores utilized. Zero percentage means they were not used at all, which is the case for the element of operation that does not do any matrix math, while 100% means they were fully utilized. Ideally, we'd like the number to be fairly high to observe good training speedups. There are two main ways we can improve tensor core performance. One is to satisfy the shape constraints to enable tensor cores. For linear layers, that means the input, output, and batch time message should be multiples of 8. For convolutions, the input and output channel counts should be multiples of 8. Note that this is no longer a requirement for Kubelot 11 and CUDA 8, which are available in the latest NVIDIA containers, but can still help improve performance. The second way is to ensure that tensor cores are doing enough math. If any gem dimension is 1 to 8 or smaller, then the operation is going to be memory bound rather than math bound, and the observed speedup will be in the 1 to 2x range rather than 8 to 16x range. On the right, we benchmark a linear layer with output and batch dimensions m and n of 8000 as a function of various hidden sizes k. We measure the performance for single precision training in gray and mixed precision training in green. In the ideal case where we have a large hidden size, as shown in the right, the cheat speedup is up to 6.5x on V100 because of tensor cores. However, if we change the dimension to be a non-multiple of 8, as shown in the left, 
then we get barely any speeds because tensor curves are not being used. And conversely, if our hidden size k is small, as shown in the middle, then our speedups are closer to the 2x range, which is what we will get from saving on memory traffic. To summarize, there are a few simple guidelines to maximize performance from mixed precision. First, we want to ensure that most of the training time is spent doing GPU work. This means ensuring the GPU is being fully utilized by training large models and using large mini batches, as well as eliminating CPU inefficiencies such as data preprocessing. Second, we also want to ensure math bound layers, mainly gems and convolutions, dominate the training time. We can leverage fusions to reduce time spent on memory bound layers and modify the network architecture to be more hardware friendly. And third, we want to improve tensor core utilization with good parameter choices. That means favoring multiples of 8 for linear and convolutional layer dimensions and ensure that your, your linear and convolutional layers are large enough to fully utilize the tensor core hardware. We can learn more about performance recommendations for deep learning in our performance guide and GTC webinar linked below. Now that we have reached the end of this talk, let's go over some final conclusions. In this talk, we saw the next generation of tensor cores for deep learning acceleration, introducing the latest NVIDIA Ampere GPU architecture. We have this brand new tensor core called TF32, which is the default math mode on A100, and as such brings tensor core acceleration to single precision training. It has 10 times more math throughput than Volta single precision, which translates up to six times faster training on real network workloads. For maximum speed, we recommend training mixed precision using FP16 and BF16 hash precision formats. FP16 and BF16 tensor cores provide 16 times more math throughput than FP32, and they're twice as fast than TF32 tensor cores. We have AMP software, which makes FP16 training easy in all the major frameworks with just a few lines of code. Training results match those of single precision training and require no changes to the hyperparameters. And finally, mixed precision reduces memory consumption, which enables training larger models or using larger inputs and more. Our latest GPUs also add sparsity to tensor cores to double the performance for DL inference. Thank you for joining in on this talk. Tensor cores can substantially accelerate training workloads, so we hope you'll give them a try and share your experiences with us.